From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Pork producers are growing more concerned about African swine fever virus entering the U.S. Kansas State University is conducting research into the virus, and Assistant Professor of Animal Feed Safety Cassie Jones has an update. We'll also pass along excerpts from the latest Beef Cattle Institute Cattle Chat podcast with K-State veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, and agricultural economist Dustin Pendell. Their guest is Josh Rowe of the Kansas Department of Agriculture and a local entrepreneur. And K-State Associate Professor of Horticulture Cheryl Boyer talks about planting mums and pansies this fall to brighten up the home landscape. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas State University researchers are conducting tests to learn more about the potential impact of African swine fever virus and the steps that can be taken by producers to prevent the disease from entering the United States. K-State Assistant Professor of Animal Feed Safety and Livestock Feed Manufacturing Cassie Jones is currently involved in that research. She says the good news is that ASFV is not zoonotic, and it is not something that would impact pork safety. As a result, consumers don't have to be concerned. However, that's not the case for pork producers, who Jones says are on high alert for this disease to potentially enter the United States. Because if it does, most of the highly virulent strains will cause about 100% mortality. And they do so by causing hemorrhages in the skin and internal organs. And so it's almost a nearly fatal disease, and it's highly problematic and economically devastating. We had watched African swine fever virus migrate throughout Eastern Europe for 10 to 12 years now, and it had migrated primarily through ticks and the wild boar populations. But what's been interesting and quite scary in the past six to eight weeks is that it's now been transmitted into the domestic pig populations in both Romania and in China. China includes about half of our pig population on a global basis. And their pig production ranges from backyard pigs to very highly concentrated pig farms. And because of their high concentration of pigs, predominantly in the eastern one-third of their country, as the disease has moved into the domesticated swine herd, it's become a real risk for transmission into the United States. That's because we import a high quantity of ingredients and products from China into the U.S. And so based on their agricultural practices and the high survivability of the disease, we're concerned about it coming into the United States from some of these countries where we have circulating virus. Jones says that her research centers on the different ways that African swine fever virus could enter the U.S., including through the transmission of feed or high-risk ingredients. And again, that's because it could be contaminated on ingredients that could then be used and transported into the United States and fed to pigs, which would cause then transmission throughout our United States domestic swine herd. One of the things we're most concerned about is that ingredients are highly likely to get contaminated based on common drying practices that would occur within countries. Uh, Many of the countries that have circulating virus We'll use the roadways for both drawing and threshing mechanisms and then collect all of the grains that have been dried and threshed and transport those internationally. So that's certainly a way where we could see some contamination both from vehicles as well as from wild boars while that grain is on the roadways. And what's interesting about African swine fever virus is that it has a very long longevity within an ingredient. Our research and research with our collaborators has demonstrated that it can certainly survive transport from Beijing to the United States and various feed ingredients. 
She says that the emphasis now is providing producers and feed manufacturers with information to help eliminate AFSV or at least prevent its entry within the United States. We have recently put a number of resources on our website, www.kswine.org, to help producers and feed manufacturers understand what they can be doing to help prevent African swine fever virus transmission into the United States. Some of these things include just prevention of import of some of the ingredients from high-risk countries that have shown susceptibility to harbor the virus. Things like soybean meal and choline chloride have been demonstrated to harbor virus or keep it viable for a long period of time. And based on agricultural practices, they may be more likely to get contaminated than other ingredients like synthetic amino acids that might be fermented in a laboratory. And so based on that, that's one of the recommendations we have. There are also resources on our website like what producers can be asking their feed manufacturers and what types of questions to be asking. And all of these things are what we'll also be stressing at our K-State Swine Day on November 15th. Jones says that Kansas State has ongoing research into the AFS virus. We know that there are some feed ingredients that can harbor the virus long enough to get here into the United States. But then what happens? And so some of our ongoing research is understanding what is the minimum infectious dose or the dose of virus that would be in a feed or an ingredient that could cause infectivity within an animal. And that's an important concept because it gives us a target as we look at different things like medium chain fatty acids or other chemical or feed additives that we could use to help make the feed safer. We need to understand what is the target we're trying to reach of how much African swine fever virus could actually cause illness within an animal. And so that project, as well as understanding what are some feed additives or chemical additives that we could apply to the feed to make it safer, that is the type of research that we'll be describing and rolling out at the K-State Swine Day. According to Jones, researchers hope to have more answers once the data has been completely analyzed in a few weeks. One of the challenges with research is trying to understand what is currently there and how applicable is it to our current situation. The minimum infectious dose of African swine fever virus is known in three different strains, but it's not known in the highly virulent Georgia strain that's currently circulating in China. And so that being the one that would be most likely or highest risk to transmit to the United States is an important question. And we are just now analyzing the results so that we can hopefully be helping producers understand what is that level of virus that could cause infectivity here within the next couple of weeks. She says that the impact of African swine fever virus reaching the U.S. would be far-reaching. This would be important economically to the swine industry. It's estimated to cause about $4 billion of impact if it were to get into the United States. But I also, my husband ranches full time. I think that this is something that would cause repercussions across the entire meat supply and agricultural supply chain as we look at soybean and corn prices and what they would do for feeding pigs and those different ingredients as well as other competitive meat products that certainly whenever we have a market disruptor to this level, it would cause a chain reaction across a number of agricultural commodities. Having a major virus like African swine fever virus enter the country would be devastating economically to our agricultural sector. It also, I think, would be very damaging from an emotional perspective as we think about 100% mortality to those affected domesticated herds with no vaccine and no potential treatment. For pork producers, African swine fever virus is considered worse than foot and mouth disease because we hear about FMD, but there's a vaccine for foot and mouth disease, and there is some level of treatment. There is no treatment or vaccine available for African swine fever virus. Its treatment and its mode of treatment, according to USDA, is a stamping out procedure where we would have mortality and um, euthanasia of large farms. One question that seems to keep coming up among producers, according to Jones, is just how long specific high-risk ingredients can be stored. For example, if we have a quarantine time, is that an effective mitigation technique? As we've looked at the research, we understand that a lot of the half-lives or quarantine times that have been developed are, are relying on a linear degradation scale, where actually viruses tend to degrade 
slowly over time. And so we're concerned that there's just not enough data to help us understand how long we should hold a feed ingredient, and if so, what those target times should be. Instead, as of right now, the best option is if you have a high-risk ingredient like soybean meal from a high-risk country, like one that would have transmitting virus, the best option right now is to exclude it from your pork diets. She says the concern is that producers storing those ingredients for 60 days or longer might make false assumptions and have a false sense of security that that's going to be effective because she says it probably won't be. And if African swine fever virus were to enter the U.S., Jones says that it would be more devastating for the pork industry than the PEDV virus was. The PEDV virus, though, um, has a very low infectious dose, meaning it doesn't take much virus to get an animal sick, but it's actually not a very hardy virus. Also, it's one that only affects suckling pigs and nursery pigs from a more morbidity and mortality perspective. And so grow finished pigs, we maybe saw a little bit of morbidity, but we didn't have the death loss like we would expect with African swine fever virus. And so African swine fever virus is quite a bit scarier than PEDV. ASF, it takes more virus to get an animal sick is what, what our hypothesis would be, but the virus stays for a very long period of time. It is not likely to be as susceptible to degradation over time or thermal processing like PEDV. And instead of just affecting young pigs, this is a virus that would have mortality across all ages of pigs. That's K-State Assistant Professor of Animal Feed Safety and Livestock Feed Manufacturing Cassie Jones with more information on African swine fever virus research being done at Kansas State University. You can find more information on AFSV at kswine.org, kswine.org. This reminder to listen to the podcast version of Agriculture Today, visit agtoday.net, agtoday.net, or using an app on your mobile device, type these search keywords, Agriculture, Today, Kansas, and you'll find this program. By tapping the subscribe button, brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device. That's agtoday.net. This is the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Up next, excerpts from the latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast from a team of researchers at the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. This week, K-State veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson, K-State cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, and K-State agricultural economist Dustin Pendell are joined by guest Josh Rowe. Here's Brad. Josh, happy to have you join us today. Uh, we want to introduce yourself a little bit before we jump in. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Josh Rowe, and you know, wear many hats in my life between farmer and my day job. I work at the Kansas Department of Agriculture, but then I've also had the opportunity, one of the board members, owners of the Manhattan Meat Market, little specialty butcher shop here in Manhattan, been open for about 15 months. Excellent. And that's, and that's one of the things we wanted to talk, because we've talked several times about demand, some of the consumer trends. Then we'll talk about some of the things you've learned here from dealing with our, our consumers here yeah. in Manhattan. We'll dive into some of the big trends in agriculture, and then we'll finish up talking about some meetings that we've been to recently. Has there been any big surprises that you thought, oh, consumers are going to want this, but when they actually come in and get it, they ask different questions or have different things they want? Yeah, I think two things have been really interesting looking at, you know, year and a half of consumer choice. And Manhattan's a really neat kind of experiment to do this. And you have a lot of diversity being a, a college town and then uh, tends to be 
you know, trying to be a little higher income. You know, a group of us that opened it up, we opened it up, number one, because we really like to eat and cook meat, right? But it really is this chance to provide the education to consumers. So we get questions, you know, all over the board and we want to be known as someone that's trusted. At the end of the day, what we want to focus on is that we're really fortunate to have such a reliable, safe food supply. So everything's safe. Everything was ethically produced that's uh, in the market. And then real quick on the on the local aspect, that's, you know, different levels of consumer. Someone's coming in looking for maybe the muscular cuts or something more value. Seems to be, as we've seen with all trends, less concerned than someone looking for something higher end. And especially that higher end, even though, you know, feed yards for, you know, ILS and beef marketing group, you're what, basically from great and uh, Garden City and uh, all the way further south and west of there, that tends to be local enough. But, you know, we do have animals that are raised within 10 miles of the Manhattan yeah. area as well. And I, and I think it's interesting to see kind of that snapshot of how, how the consumers are coming in and asking some of those questions. And it's great to have a forum to be able to answer those. Because sometimes you're in a situation where when people are purchasing meat, and we've had some offline conversations before about the four of us going to buy meat at different places yeah. and there's really no opportunity to ask any questions yeah. if you had some to ask. So I yeah. think that's, I think that's really good. The other thing I wanted to do is I found an article on ag web and it talked about mega trends in agriculture. And I, and there are 10 of these on this list. So I'm going to read them to you guys and I'd like you to pick out in sort of a impossible question, but what do you think's the biggest one on this list and why? The most mega mega yeah. trend. The most mega mega trend. So Super here, mega. Here they are. The number one, shifting farm structure. Number two, acceleration in technology. Number three, biotechnology strategy evolves. Four, specialization to continue. Five, resource scarcity. Six, changing commodity environment. Seven, shift in the meat consumption. So this is talking domestically. Eight, public scrutiny of livestock treatment. Nine, the growth of environmentalism. And 10, government policy in flux. So which of those, and all of them are important, all of them are big and influencing ag, but I'll, I'll frame it this way. Which of them do you think is the most important to the beef industry? Josh, you want well, to Well, they tend to, you know, we've talked a lot about the consumer here, and I really think it is this. That's where it starts with the, with, with the consumer. And that will go forth to other. So, you know, something I've always been really interested in and real passionate about is the use of technology, you know, of, of all different sides. I've seen what it's, you know, brought to my own operation and that. But it is, it's, it's really in, it's about, you know, attempting to be able to educate the consumers on, on something that, it means something rather than just uh, them buzzwords through there. At, so. at least to be able to allow, and I'd say communication. Yeah. Because yeah. you can transfer that list of wants and needs back to the production yeah. side and vice versa. Transfer the list of here's how we can efficiently do this and, and in other manners. Dustin, what do you think? Probably had to agree with Josh from the, thinking about the consumer side. But it's not just necessarily domestic consumers. It's international consumers yeah. as well. Um, when we think about... You think you said government policy? Well, you know, there's what another two hundred million dollars in tariffs announced, mm -hmm. and so I think the consumer, domestic and international, is important. But I think another interesting piece is that biotech. I think Josh mentioned the technology is you know right now I don't, the USDA, FDA, they're holding some joint meetings to talk about who's you know gets to have the final say in, in some of the biotech, and I think that's interesting because you think about some gene editing and and now all of a sudden. Maybe we edit genes where we don't have a FMD or, or something along yeah. those lines. I think that could be a huge thing, and maybe more from a production standpoint. But that again comes back to the consumers because we can maybe be able to do it, but if they're not going to purchase or consume it, I mean, is it yeah, worth doing I, it? And I, so well, that's the driver of almost every other industry in the U.S. Right? As consumers vote with their dollars, what they right. want, that's what drives yep. industries to grow or shrink. And I think a lot of those you mentioned, environmental, well, that comes back to, well, what do the consumers think? And yeah. So I would agree that the consumers is probably the most important, at least in my mind, to the beef industry. Yeah, and there might have been a place in time where we could, as an agricultural industry, just, you know, really work in this vacuum, really work on our efficiency side, which, you know, which will benefit all those other pieces from your environmental, your bottom line, your consumer prices. We tended to be able to maybe operate in a vacuum and then just 
provide these goods to the consumer and there was no questions asked you purchase a product and it's that's definitely not the case anymore it's got to be got to start from that demand side i may come from a little different angle and look at the production side of it in that a couple of things you talked about were adoption of technology or, or the availability of technology and then farm structure and again trying to focus just on the beef side i'm not going to i'm going to say that it's tied to the crop side And most of the technologies that I'm aware of, both in the recent past and and what people are talking about coming forward, really allow a single person to do more work than they were previously or with less risk. More production. More production, which changes some of the structure. It changes the size. So if if I can get done more uh, with less labor or less risk, I'm going to get bigger. And so I think there is still that there's going to be a push towards that now. The interesting thing, you talk about some of the biotechnology and consumer things, those might be pressures to be smaller. So I might segregate certain production practices, whether it's crops with specific traits or cattle with specific traits, which then would somewhat put pressure back towards small. But I I think that would only be temporary. I think we're going to continue to see specialization. So actually, several of the things I lumped into one thought was use of technology, including biotechnology, changing farm structure, just kind of the size of operations and how that's going to sell with the consumer. So I answered it probably totally unfair. I lumped them all together and say that really these mega trends are going together. But I'm thinking more from the production side. So the production is going to change. It needs to be in line with what the consumers want. But production is going to continue to kind of shift. They're very much tied. When you, yes. when you look at how the crop production influences cattle production and, and as you move forward. Yeah, I, I think you know one of the, the things that sort of and I'm kind of like Bob, there's, there's several thoughts in there that are, that are really intrinsically linked. And one of those, you know, the, the changing consumer trend, both domestically and internationally, and our access to those markets, so you can pull in the kind of the government flux. You know, China's a huge opportunity for us as beef producers to sell a product um, that is in high demand. But if we don't have any market access, we're clearly limited. I think the other piece in there is the, the shift in commodity structure. So moving away from you know traditional sort of commodity markets, which I think at some point we're going to have to change the way we price fed cattle and yeah. that system's kind of getting more pressure. I mean, it's we've, we've known there's a challenge there for a long time. I'm not sure we've got any great solutions, but aligning the value chain towards a specific product or sets of products, you know, there's, there's channels in the market helps fix some of that. Um, and so I, you know, if we can tie specific production practices and, and cattle targeted for specific markets, either domestically or internationally, that kind of fixes and hits a couple of those topics. So, and the certainty is change, change, right? Is that, right. Is that it, things are going to continue to evolve as we go forward. And I think those are all good points as we look at that. And one of the things that we want to do, and, and as we discuss this, is make you aware of some of those things that are going on, and you can come up with a strategy for how, do, how does my operation fit into that in the, in the future. Yep. The other thing I want to share, I was at the American Association of Bovine Practitioners last week, which is a national meeting of, of bovine veterinarians, in fact, the largest national meeting of bovine veterinarians. They gathered in Phoenix. It was a great meeting, lots of people there. One, a couple things that I, I observed just walking around – Lots of young people coming in, new either students or young veterinarians, and that collegiality, that back and forth, how do we get better, how do we make improvements, many of the same trends that we just discussed were actually discussed at that meeting on how do we, how do we apply some of this technology in this situation, how do we make a difference as we're going forward, and how do we communicate with both customers and a lot of focus on how do we provide a good service when we're, when we're working in that environment? So it was a, a really good meeting. Brad White, Bob Larson, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pandell of the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. This week's guest was Josh Rowe. To subscribe to the Cattle Chat podcast, visit ksubci.org. This is the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, the U.S. and Japan have agreed to begin trade negotiations. Gary Crawford has the details. Can some people forecast the future? Well, back in January, the Agriculture Department's Undersecretary for Trade, Ted McKinney, told an audience as far as some kind of trade agreement with Japan is concerned. I believe it is not a matter of if but when something will come. And sure enough, something came this week after meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Abe, President Trump, telling reporters in New York. We're starting trade talks with Japan. And I'm sure we'll make a very good deal. And after an ag trade trip to Japan back in June, Ted McKinney said Japanese buyers told him they already love U.S. ag products. Why? First, the quality. It's a good quality product. Hand in glove with that is the trust in the regulatory system that says it's safe. You know, usually the U.S., with its size and scope, has an opportunity to deliver volumes of product. So U.S. ag products are an easy sell in Japan. It's already our fourth largest market for U.S. ag products. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. The USDA recently announced funding awards related to the rebuild and improvement of rural water and wastewater systems and infrastructure. Rod Bain reports. $392 million of investment in most every state. That's the numbers behind a recent announcement of USDA loans and grants designed to assist rebuilding and improving rural water and wastewater infrastructure. This is through our water and waste disposal loan and grant program. These are investments that will improve lives in 42 states, 120 different infrastructure projects, and believe will benefit over 400,000 people living in rural America. That's the assistant to the Secretary for Rural Development, Ann Hazlett. She made the award announcement at a recent conference in Texas, sponsored by the National Rural Water Association. This is a program that offers long-term, low-interest loans and can be used to help finance drinking water, stormwater drainage, and other waste disposal systems for rural communities that have 10,000 or fewer residents. So what do some of these rural water and wastewater infrastructure projects benefiting from these specific loan and grant programs look like? Hazlett starts with a project in the natural state. In Arkansas, the city of Stuttgart is receiving a loan to help replace some of the water lines in their communities, which are old and deteriorating. That's much of our infrastructure in rural America is outdated and in need of replacement, and this is a good example of that. So because of this investment, the project will really help the city to have a safe and more reliable water supply for its residents. Meanwhile, in the South Dakota community of Oral, we have an opportunity for the community to dig a new well. In that community, the district there already has two wells, but one of them was not producing the quantity of water that was needed. And so constructing a new well will really help supplement kind of that existing system and provide a water supply that's more adequate to better serve its customers. Hazlett says the increased water supply in Oral not only means new potential economic opportunity. It also really helps the community not be so reliant on water from neighboring systems and needing to purchase water elsewhere. She adds, in many cases, other federal partners and nonprofit organizations work with the Agriculture Department to also provide funding for awarded water and wastewater infrastructure projects. Working together with our partners, we have an enormous opportunity with this funding really to improve the quality of life and create economic opportunity for the future in rural America. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. In other agricultural news, research updates are the cornerstone of Kansas State University's annual Swine Day, set for November 15th. According to Mike Tokash, University Distinguished Professor and a Swine Extension Specialist in K-State's Department of Animal Sciences and Industry, this year will be a great opportunity to hear about the current status of the swine industry, foreign disease threats, and how new research findings can be implemented on-farm to improve productivity and economics. The event kicks off with a technology trade show at 8 that morning in the K-State Alumni Center at 17th and Anderson Avenue. During the morning session, K-State faculty will give updates on the latest research impacting producers in 15-minute rotations covering topics on swine nutrition, management, feed processing, and feed safety. 
The afternoon program begins with David Hogg and Sarah McReynolds from the Kansas Department of Agriculture discussing the benefits of implementing secure pork supply for producers. Roger Main, director of the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at Iowa State University, will cover emerging diseases and how diagnostic labs are adapting to help producers. The Swine Day program begins at 9.30 and includes lunch. The day wraps up with a reception at 3.30 featuring K-State's Call Hall ice cream. Registration is $25 per person if paid by November 7th and $50 after that date or at the door. Students, if they register by November 7th, can attend free of charge. Registration is available online at ksuswine.org, ksuswine.org. And finally, in this week's KLA Update, young livestock producers recently toured various segments of the beef and dairy industries in central and western Kansas. Todd Domer with the Kansas Livestock Association has highlights from that three-day tour. This was the third installment of the year-long educational experience for the 2018 KLA Young Stockman's Academy. Mushrush Red Angus near Strong City hosted the first stop for a look at the family's registered Red Angus cow-calf operation. The Mushrush family uses data management and performance testing extensively with trade emphasis on calving ease, maintenance energy, and stability. While in the area, the group visited the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve north of Strong City, where they participated in a discussion about the importance of prescribed burning to the Flint Hills ecosystem. In western Kansas, Pokey Feeders Assistant Manager Grant Morgan highlighted the yard's water reclamation system. The Scott City Feed Yard was the first in Kansas to recycle overflow water as part of conservation efforts. Reeve Cattle Company of Garden City served as a stop, with current KLA President Lee Reeve providing a tour of the 46,000 head feed yard and adjoining ethanol plant. The plant produces about 17 million gallons of ethanol per year, with its byproduct, distiller's grain, used as part of the feeding ration in the feed yard. At Noble Dairy near Garden City, manager Will Basham talked about the dynamics of the 2,500 head dairy, which produces four truckloads of milk per day. Dodge City Veterinary Clinic practitioner Chad Kerr stressed the importance of having a good relationship with a veterinarian. The trip also included a tour of the National Beef Plant at Dodge City. The 20 members of this year's KLA Young Stockman's Academy class will gather for one final session November 28th through the 30th at the KLA Convention in Wichita. I'm Todd Domer. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. This is the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Randall Kowalik sitting in for Eric Atkinson, and it's Thursday, so time for our weekly horticulture segment. And this week, instead of going out into the yard and garden areas of our homes, we're going to look ahead uh, down the calendar at fall. And in the next month or so, we're going to see a wide variety of fall decorative items that will begin to emerge in the nurseries and garden centers and some of our retailers. Joining us to discuss some of these things and I guess how to get the most bang for your buck perhaps is Cheryl Boyer who is an associate professor in horticulture and uh, at Kansas State University and K-State Research and Extension uh, specialist in nursery crops and horticulture marketing. Cheryl, this is something that it's an annual thing, uh, and this is about the time when not only consumers start gearing up for it, but but also the commercial side is, is starting to gear up for it as well. That's right. You know, it's hard to believe, but here we are in September, and fall is here. So it is mum time, it's pansy time, it's fall festival time, and there's no better opportunity to make some plans than now. So... Um, 
We've got mums coming up. And I think one thing that might surprise people from the production side of things is that the mums that, that are going to be for sale or already for sale or that you're going to buy soon were put into production, oh, probably April or May. So about the time we were buying our petunias and our Mother's Day flowers, they were also starting mums for sale in the fall. So there's lots of them available, new cultivars every single year in just about every color you can imagine. And most of the ones they sell are hardy. So if you wanted to put them in the ground, they may come back. I try to think of them as just seasonal color and toss them when they're done and and get to pick something new next year. They usually won't come back quite as well if you plant them in the garden, um, but they can if you've got lots of space and you want to stick them in the ground. But I I like them as seasonal color and you can pick lots of different things in, in terms of having a agricultural uh, display for the season. Hay bales are popular, um, corn stalks, all sorts of things that you can get. Pumpkins, of course, goodness. And the the types in, of pumpkins these days are pretty fun. So you can get small ones, big ones, colored ones, knobbly ones, all sorts of fun decorative gourds and pumpkins and bring in the season. And pretty soon we'll see the colors on the of the leaves on the trees changing color. So that'll be exciting as well. I think it's already started to cool off some. I like it. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, when we talk about mums, uh, you're going into the nursery. You've got a huge display area of mums. How do you pick the best one? What do you look for? You know, mums are a crop that's generally really consistent. And there are lots of other nursery crops that I would have a lot of really good advice for how to pick out a good one in a block. But for the most part, look for, for in mums, you're looking for consistency. And you want to pick one that's not in full bloom yet. So you, it's better to pick one that the buds are still tight on it because it's it's a kind of a one and done thing. The flowers do last for a pretty good long time, several weeks. But if it's already completely in bloom, then you've already missed part of that show time for your house. So look for ones that have some color on it so you can see if you like the color and then choose one preferably that hasn't bloomed at all yet, but is definitely headed in that direction. If you see an open flower, you don't know if that flower has been open for one week or three weeks. Yes, but usually they're on a mum, they're all going to bloom at the same time. Now, there are mums that are... All going all to bloom on the plant, on an individual plant. Yes, the, the bloom show on the, the container of mums will generally all happen at the same time. And there are different mums that bloom early season, mid season, and late season. So if you wanted to make sure that you have continuous color for the next month and a half, look for those terms on the label or the marketing pieces that say when they bloom. So you could go ahead and get some now that are about to to burst into color and then some that will burst into color in two weeks and some that will be exciting a month from now. So there's lots of options there. And definitely take advantage of cabbage and kale and pansies. They, those are cool season annual plants that will, they don't like being hot. So they'll thrive and live for a good long time into the winter. Um, and some of them may stick around through quite a few snowstorms. So give it a shot. The pansies, uh, those, are going to be, those are going to be seedling plants that we'll be seeing right now? Yeah, those are annuals that you'll see just like you would see spring annuals. Um, and sometimes we see pansies early in the spring season as well. They don't always overwinter in a container, usually not, but sometimes. So they're generally plants that you'll see both in the fall and in the spring, but not in the summer. Although there is at least one variety coming from the breeding side of things that will go all summer long. Usually people want to change out their containers and try something new and there are options for that. So mums and pansies are things that we want to watch for as far as the ornamentals go. Now, of course, there's going to be the pumpkin patch, but there are going to be these other these other things as well, these other decorative squashes that um, that we're going to find in, in some of the nurseries and garden centers. You know, I found myself just recently spending some time looking for those weekend opportunities to keep my kids occupied and, and consider and, and give me credit for having done something on the weekend. And one of the things that has really caught my eye recently is Facebook events. The events function that they have on Facebook is a really great way to 
curate these opportunities and see what's going on in your neck of the woods. And, you know, as as much as we love or hate Facebook, it does provide some really helpful tools, especially the personalization aspect of it. So their algorithm will target events happening around you. And hopefully you don't have to drive too far, but you can also, you know, include greater search functions. So if you really want to go to a pumpkin patch and you're willing to drive 200 miles to do it, you can find out what all the pumpkin patches are in a 200 mile radius and when they're open and what they have available and all those things. But it's great for um, just planning your day to day and finding out what sorts of great ways you can celebrate agriculture with other people this fall. Cheryl, thanks for joining us. K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Cheryl Boyer discussing some of the signs of fall you can find in local garden centers and nurseries. Look to mums and pansies for fresh fall color, and you'll also find plenty of pumpkins, gourds, and squashes in the weeks ahead. Our time is done for today, but remember that if you ever miss the daily broadcast of this program, you can download the podcast to the device of your choice. Just visit our podcast site at agtoday.net. I'm Randall Kowalik. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.